to revenue, to profit. So there's a lot more things you can do. You don't have to stop anywhere. Sky's the limit, in fact. But I'm going to stop here for this example. I hope I deliver to you. I'll introduce you to the whole data science my workflow and uh, what it's like. And uh, let's look at the second example. Email analysis. I shared this quickly, the analysis result. So Yesware is a company that makes a product for, to help people send their emails and send smarter emails. What do you mean smarter, basically? I won't get more replies. Everybody will tell you. That's the only thing they care about. I want to get more replies. So we want to find out ways to help people get more replies. So we can create an email reply model like this. First, we construct features from the email data we collected. So we have one row per email, and then we have all sorts of features. For example, the hour the email was sent, the number of recipients on that email, the number of CC recipients, whether or not the email was sent through using a template, and other a lot of things. And then you can create a model to predict the reply on each email, because each email, you, you, this is historical data, you know whether or not each email was replied. Basically, if an email, if an email was not replied within um, a week, there's a very, very tiny chance this email will ever get replied. So you only have to look at email sent up to a week ago. But if you want to be real careful, you can look at email sent over a month ago to, you know, to collect, to make sure that all the replies that should have happened have happened already. And then you have a model, and then you can create a model to predict that, and then from that model you can extract the top features that are cor strongly correlated and have a visual, visible impact on getting your reply. And we notice that among the top five, model, uh, top five features, two of them are closely related to the sent time. So uh, we summarized them uh, into sent hour and sent weekday. For sent hour, you can check the email sent volume and the reply rate by each hour. And this is taken a visualization taken of about half a million emails sent during three month period. And, and we notice that the email sent in the early morning or later afternoon have higher reply visibly than the rest of the time, probably due to lower volume of email sent over there. We cannot be absolutely sure. We cannot just say, okay, if you send email in early morning or later afternoon, you're gonna get more replies. That's not true. But we can strongly encourage our user to start experimenting on it. Set up your own A-B test and see whether it makes a visible impact. Actually, a marketing expert who I showed the, show the result to first, said immediately to, 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 to me that she said, I know it already, I know it all the time. I always send my emails at six o'clock in the afternoon because I get much more reply and much more open to it at that time. So she, from her own practices, have already got those kind of hunches. And a lot of the business users, you, you notice, they know their business domains. And that's where we get business domain knowledge from, by talking to them. So this is sent hour. We can also check the sent weekday. And here, I didn't notice too much difference between the Monday to Friday kind of difference, but we notice the difference between weekday and weekend. For example, here, emails sent over the weekend tend to have a higher reply than sent over the weekday. There may be a lot of reasons behind this. For example, you wouldn't send a working email to somebody over a weekend unless, say, it's a very urgent thing or it's a close friend or something like that. So there's a lot of guesses and uh, possibilities out there, but we just recorded it from the data point of view, and we present it from the data point of view. So I'm not making any conclusions here, but you can experiment sending more emails over a weekend. For example. And we could also, we included a lot of subject features uh, in, the, in the data mining process. Uh, things like a number of words, a number of keywords, TFIDF kind of uh, fancy things, and notice some patterns. For one thing, you can look at the keyword. The keyword, I show you this EV visualization, which is my favorite, so here. Oh, I forgot that I, magically I'm connected to internet. <laughs> uh, I was not able to throughout the, <laughs> so, okay, so this is a EV visualization. Um, for each of the bubble, is a keyword using some subject, and of course we only looked at the top use keywords. And uh, the horizontal axis means the open rate, and the vertical axis means the reply rate. And the bubble size 
means number of emails sent with that keyword in it. So higher bubble account and medium bubble next, the review bubble. We can group the keywords. How could we can use it? So for one thing, we can group the keywords based on their functionality. For example, you notice that call, meeting, time, and calendar tend to be the keywords most likely being used when you try to schedule a meeting. And in that sense, when you're writing such an email, maybe you're not completely sure which one will get you more reply, but looking at the distribution of the party, you should try to avoid using the word calendar. And it's debatable whether, uh, whether, whether using time uh, is really worse than using call, but apparently from the performance, data performance point of view, uh, using call uh, for experiment meeting and time. And this is the overall distribution of costs. You individually may have a different distribution. If you want to, you know, say, look at this information from one company, like a, a customer, because this one was B2B, so we can look at their company's own data and get even finer insights from there. Yeah. So B3 is pretty cool. You can hop over and get detailed information like that. Let me go back to the... So I've done with the two examples over here, and uh, in what is left, I quickly introduced to you a uh, data science toolbox. Before that, I want to just quickly talk about why do we need a toolbox? Why do we need a toolbox? I, as a rare person who covered both area in academia and uh, industry, uh, I thought, I've been thinking about difference in approaches in these two fields. So I wanted to try a goal-oriented, top-down approach. Start with the goal. Academia, the goal is to improve human knowledge. Agree with me or not? Somewhat true, right? Okay, <laughs> in industry, the goal is to make money. That is absolutely true. <laughs> so in academia, so the goal leads to success criteria. In academia, your success is marked by publishing papers. Most likely. <laughs> um, in industry, your success is marked by creating and delivering business values, which will be turned into money making in the longer or shorter, the shorter term. Then the typical approach in, in academia is to find better way to do a new thing. Either find a better way to do a new thing or find a way to do a new thing. You want to have something new. Having something new, of course, Factor is important. Is you have to have a unique result. Well, you don't have to do that in industry. In industry, the approach typically is to find the fastest way to do a lot of things. The other day, I showed it to my boss. Uh, I said I have an idea I want to share with you. Originally, I put over here finding the fastest way to do a lot of easy things, and he was thinking, and I was thinking, okay, no, I don't mean. I don't mean easy, I don't mean that. But let's remove that. I just mean a lot of things. You want to really do it fast. Speed is much more important in the industry than in academia. In academia, you can write very lousy codes. I write a lot of lousy codes myself. And, uh, but as long as you get your thing done, nobody's going to reuse the codes again, most likely. In industry, teamwork is a constant scenario. You have to think about how other people will check your code, reproduce the result, and make it into product, into all sorts of things. You have to write very readable and very well formatted codes with a lot of comments whenever possible. Speed is important in industry. In order to get the speed, you need a toolbox. I just introduced to you a couple of data science tools I myself have been relatively familiar with. It doesn't cover all the tools out there. There are a ton of different things out there, but oftentimes, most likely, you're going to hear Python and R. As I mentioned a little bit earlier, R is really great for prototyping. R is, has a lot of package, great package supports. R has great community support. You ask any question, you get answer on Stack Overflow. Or you can put in just search your question. Somebody most likely have already asked it before. And R is somewhat okay for data mounting, not so great. Whenever you try to load a data set of 100 million in R, you want to uh, you, you can give it a try, but don't have too much hope for that. Basic and uh, for on the other hand, Python is much better with the data mounting. Python can load uh, a lot bigger data set, a lot faster than R. For data exploration, R is superior because 
it has very great visualization tools and uh, allows you to do anything, basically. And for machine learning, R has any package, any algorithm that you have heard of, probably there's a R package already. Actually, a lot of uh, people in the machine learning field, they publish R package when they write a paper so that you can use it. So in Python, it's, it's a great and a lot of ways catching up with R. Python is a scripted language to begin with. Uh, to begin with, you can use it to do real programming. Uh, but uh, Python is growing so fast in terms of visualization. For example, there's a ggplot package in, in Python already, mimicking ggplot2 in R. There's a secret learn package in Python, doing all sorts of machine learning fancy stuff. And this is very advanced compared to everything else. And uh, let me mention Unix. Unix too is like a all-purpose kind of quick thing, and a lot of people uh, like to do something on the command line whenever possible. So it's good to get yourself uh, familiar with some Unix commands uh, if you want to get you know, up to speed for general things. SQL is kind of domain knowledge and language of English in data launching or data integration. Um, you want to, SQL is awful easy to learn also. So, so it's like a really worth the effort to maybe spend, spend a week if you want to do something serious and to, to get used to SQL because you're going to see it everywhere. And Scala is a new, uh, new language out there for big data. Uh, I mentioned big data after a bit short while because Scala um, yeah, it's, very, it's very good for big data. So before that, uh, go quickly a list of data visualization tools that I personally like. Uh, I like to use Excel or it's uh, you know, when, if you will ever work in the finance, you're gonna have to use Excel. You're gonna be have to be really good at it. Uh, in R, of course, it's great for visualization. Tableau is a commercialized um, software, which is uh, great, great for data visualization. D3 is the D3 chart, the subject keyword chart I just showed you. It's very nice for making shiny web pages. And uh, it's uh, written based on JavaScript, so there's a little bit of a steeper learning curve out there. And so I shared this slide with you, so you don't have to try to memorize it. So quickly, oh, I'm running out of time. <laughs> <laughs> big data, so I do it quickly. So big data ecosystem, big data is growing fast. Ever, whenever you hear big data, chances are you hear about Hadoop. Hadoop is a fast system. It's, uh, it's growing fast, there's a lot of new things happening on it. And when you hear about MapReduce, MapReduce is a computing system on top of the file system called Hadoop. In other words, when people think MapReduce equals Hadoop, this is not true. Hadoop is Hadoop, MapReduce is MapReduce. Spark is a new computing system to replace MapReduce. And Spark can work directly on Hadoop or on other file systems such as Amazon S3 and other things. And you can, the Spark is growing very, very fast in the community. In other words, you have an Apache Spark called Stack where it covers Spark SQL, which is great for data mounting, Spark Streaming, great for real-time processing, MLlib, machine learning library, and GraphX for visualization. All these are constantly changing like uh, every month. They have a new version every month. Last time, two months ago, when Spark uh, upgraded to 1.2.0, MLlib had Renovaris finally in it. But it's still in very um, basic shape. It doesn't have a lot of uh, parameter tuning opportunities out there. But if you know Scala, because Spark is written on Java, and so Java and Scala, uh, and it's written actually on, in Java, uh, in Scala, but running on JVM Java virtual machine. Uh, so if you know Scala, you can look at Spark open source, or uh, open code, which is uh, open to everybody on GitHub, and they can understand how exactly each machine learning algorithm was written over there. And you can even write your own code and commit to it. You can become a contributor. So a quick talk about big data. Thank you for your attention.